noticias. Como veis tenemos con nosotros al astronauta Paolo Nespoli, una persona que ha estado este mismo año, ha estado en la Estación Espacial Internacional y una persona que, como digo, ha estado enseñándonos la belleza del espacio, la belleza de la Tierra desde, desde la Estación Espacial Internacional y lo ha hecho a través de usando las redes sociales, ha usado Twitter, eh, todos lo habéis podido seguir como astro-paolo a, a través de las redes sociales. Quiero darle las gracias a Paolo Nespoli por estar aquí con nosotros y por enseñarnos de nuevo la belleza del espacio. Muchas gracias. Yes, good uh, afternoon everybody. I'm sorry. I'm going to speak in English here. Who who does not understand English here? What? Everybody understand English? Yeah, no, I understand, but I wanted to know who is uh, listening through the headset and who can go nature live. Most of it. Okay, very good. Um, yes. So we have uh, about an hour, 55 minutes here. And uh, I will try to make a quick presentation talking a little bit about uh, what it means uh, to go in space, why we go in space. We'll get some uh, views from space. We'll just try to, to get excited about it. So I want to hear, I want to see some smiles, you know. I'm going to try to leave some space at the end for questions. So you should have, uh, should prepare your questions. If you would have any question that is so urgent that you cannot wait, just raise your hand and let's talk. It's, uh, it's easy and nice and it's good when people uh, participate to it. So this is a presentation about a little bit like, like the Earth from above. So the way we, why we go in space and why we go, we bring the Earth outside the earth. It's a kind of a weird uh, concept here. And, uh, and the subtitle is uh, the dream. So the dream of going in space. I was a, a child when, uh, when, I, when I dreamed of going in space and then eventually I was able to, to realize this dream. But you know, there are a lot of dreams and we will talk about uh, dreams and how to, my suggestion to you and how to approach them. Am I talking good? Too fast? Is that okay? All right. Okay, so the first thing, I get a lot of questions here usually, and, uh, and, I, and, I, and I've been asked always, why do we go in space? I mean, why don't we go on Earth? Why, don't we, why do we go up there? I mean, because there are some risks involved, there are a lot of costs, so but why we go up there? And the reason is that because there and only there we can find some uh, conditions, some environmental conditions that allow us to do something that we cannot do on Earth. Otherwise we'll, we will be here on Earth uh, on doing this. But we go up there and we find, for example, a microgravity environment where gravity does not exist anymore. You just imagine if here suddenly gravity would go away, we all would float around, everything will float, things will go weird, liquids will flow around, will get out of the bottles. There are no environment on Earth like this. You cannot simulate this, except for very little period of times. So we go up there, we can conduct scientific research, do test new technology, because when you, when you force yourself to go in places where it's very difficult to go, and you have to have a machine that keeps you alive, then you really go on, uh, on the edge of technology. And by doing things in this way, you really discover a lot of processes, a lot of things, a lot of materials, a lot of equipment that then you can use in everyday work. Uh, it, it, it's known that the computers today are so small and so fast and whatever they are, because in the 60s, the American really pushed hard to put uh, a, a spacecraft on the moon and they could not bring the computer at that time they were as big as half of this room so they had to really work really hard to make it small uh, and then the last one which I even think is even the most important is to explore we don't explore on the space station around earth 
but we explore, we go to the moon, we want to go to Mars. This is part of our nature. This is, this is the difference, one of the differences between us and the animals. We want to understand what is around us, we want to explore, and we want to keep going. The, the civilization that stopped exploring are the ones that died. The ones that expand and wanted to know are the ones that got all the good things, make them uh, part of their culture, and they kept uh, exploring and, and learning and keep going. So exploring wanted to go to Mars and see what is there. It's one of the reasons why we go up there. It's not, it's not a, a simple one. So currently, we don't go to Mars as yet. We will in uh, some years. But currently, we do go in space, and we go to the International Space Station that rotates around Earth right at this moment. And currently, there are three people on board of the space station. Uh, the altitude is about 400 kilometers, which is relatively low, but it's outside the atmosphere. We just want to have uh, a microgravity environment, and if we would go higher, it would just cost more. If we go lower, we'll fall down on Earth. So we stay there, which is the minimum altitude that keeps us uh, safe up there. Uh, we fly at 28,500 kilometers per hour, which is the orbital velocity of 400 kilometers. That, that is about 7 kilometers per second. That means that uh, we fly around the Earth in about an hour and a half. That means that every 40, 50 seconds, uh, sorry, minutes, there is a sunset or a sunrise. So you are in space and in one day you have 16 sunsets and 16 sunrises. So you, you see a lot of things that normally on Earth you cannot see. It's it's big. The space station inside is big. Do we have a laser pointer by chance? Um, I forgot mine. But, uh, space station is big. You know that structure up there, up there, it's about the size of a football field. So a soccer field, so pretty big. Uh, the central part, it's uh, pressurized. That part there. And uh, thank you. This part here is pressurized, and those are uh, modules that are about 10 meters in, in length and 5 meters in diameter. And the, the inside space is about 2 meters by 2. So there are these corridors with 2 meters by 2, and there is equipment everywhere on the sides, on the walls, as we do here on Earth, but also on the floor and on the, on the deck. So you can work in any position there. So the space is like it's multiplied, and it's pretty big. Uh, and, uh, and there are uh, four partners that have built and maintained the space station, which is United States, Russia, Europe, Japan, and Canada. For Europe, the European Space Agency is taking care of this, and there are nine uh, countries in, in, uh, in Europe that participate to this program. Oh, let's see. So normally, on, uh, in space, we have a crew of six people, and it works in a way that you, you depart from uh, Baikonur in Kazakhstan with a small Soyuz rocket. Now we don't use the shuttle anymore. So with a small Soyuz rocket that has three people. These three people go up, dock to the station, and up there, there are already three that have been there three months. Those guys are the, the senior crew, and you that come up is the junior crew. So when I came up, here I am, these three were the junior crew, and these three were the senior crew. So they were in charge of uh, or getting everything done, and we were just trying to learn. Because, you know, you go in space, and uh, for the first month and a half, you really have to learn a lot of things. Because you, you, you force yourself to do things the way you have been doing for the years that you've done it here on Earth. And sometimes you really try to do something, and it doesn't work, or you, it's a lot of pain and a lot of effort. And then somebody shows you that in zero G, you can do something completely different, in a different way, and it's very fast and quick, and it works. So, after four months being up there, uh, we became the, the senior crew and three new guys came up. It's one, two, and three, and these guys just landed 15 days ago. And now there is three, only three people up there, and they are waiting for the other three to go up, and they will come up in about 15 days. And as you saw the, from this picture, uh, we see here, you know, Russian, 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 American, American, Italian. So there is a multicultural environment up there. 
we mainly speak English, but if you go to the Russian side, you actually speak Russian. And we do have uh, uh, control centers located in Houston, that's the main, but there's one in Moscow. Then there's one in uh, Munich that checks or controls the European module. There's one in uh, Tsukuba in Japan. So you get, get to talk to the, all these uh, various centers during the day, depend when you do experiments. This is a picture taken in Baikonur just before the morning of, uh, of the launch or the, the morning before the launch, the rocket, this is the rocket, the capsule is just this little thing here. And this is the same launch pad that Yuri Gagarin used 50 years ago. So it's really interesting how, you know, you take off uh, from this rocket in the middle of the night, we left, lift off at uh, one o'clock in the night, and, uh, and here you go, you start with a kind of a rough ride, the whole the rocket gets, you lose all the rockets, the only thing that is left is this part here, which actually flies and then docks on the space station. By the way, do you know, do you know how long does it take from, uh, from when you take off, when you're, the rocket lift off to when you go to space? Any volunteer? Eight minutes. Haha. <laughs> Isn't that a little? Is that too little, eight minutes? Well, it's true. It's eight and a half minutes, more or less. But in eight and a half minutes, you do like 600 kilometers. So it's like going from Milan to Rome or from uh, Madrid to Granada. I think well, how far away is uh, Madrid to Granada? 600 kilometers? Huh. No? Okay. Whatever. Yes? Maybe? Something like that. So it's, 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 it's pretty fast. I mean, you go pretty fast up there. Uh, but you, then you stay... 15, uh, two days actually, in this little spacecraft like that, which is about, about like this, is the, is the back seat of a small car. And you, you're still there, you fly around the Earth, and you eventually catch up with the space station. I know that this picture, I, this picture was my spacecraft that, that we docked to the station, and I know it because if you look on this window, there is a little sign that I put up, and it says, uh, Hey guys, here we come, watch out. So I put it up there and they didn't see it. But they heard us when we docked, bong. So here is, uh, is the three guys that were already up there, one, two, three, and we, well, one is missing, it's probably the guy who was taking the picture. And we two are the new guys. It was uh, me, there was uh, an American uh, female astronaut, and you can see the, the hair, how the hair go wild in space, and, and then there is a Russian cosmonaut, which is probably taking the pictures here. I never noticed that one is missing here. Huh. Um, this is uh, part of what we call the Node 2, uh, the, which, which uh, has a lot of uh, experiment and equipment, but also our sleep station. You see these uh, cabins here? These are like uh, telephone booths, more or less. And these are called uh, private crew quarters. You see, there are, there are doors here. This is closed. This is open. And, and you see how, you know, we can sleep on the, on the ceiling, on the deck, uh, on the sides. This is me. Just got there a couple of days early. I'm trying to keep track of all my stuff. And here I am already confronted with the fact that when you unzip something, everything poof, flows out. And then you're chasing everything down the spacecraft. You always lose something. And then it... Maybe find it, maybe not. Maybe, you know, I, I lost a, a little camera once and I was there looking for it because I really needed it. I could not find it for 15 days. And then one day, one, my, my American colleague came and said, hey, I found your camera. I said, where was it? Just floating around in the middle of the lab. Okay, there's a space for you. Um, we got up there, it was just before Christmas and, and the Russian actually surprised that they put they put us, they put little uh, uh, gifts on our door. Nevertheless, the, the Russian Orthodox Christmas is 15 days later, so it was interesting. We woke up and we had these little gifts. So it's true, I can tell you, we saw Father Christmas or, uh, or whatever it's called uh, floating around and they left uh, gifts for there and we tweeted too. Now, in space, when you stay for a long time, like six months, you need to do all the usual things. Eventually, the hair grow pretty, pretty, pretty long. Uh, and then, 
and then and then the battery is finished. Actually, no, it's working, it's still going, so I don't know what happened here. Um, and then you have to cut them. I would show you that the, there is a, what happened? A virus on the space station. I did not touch anything, I swear. It was not me. Exactly, that's why we need men in space. You, f you think, you know, there are engineers on the ground building up with this uh, equipment, very complex, very expensive. They work for four or five years. Then you bring it in space, and there's always a little thing that doesn't work. I mean, this is pretty interesting. This is one of the discussions about robots in space and, uh, and human, and what is the value of bringing up uh, an astronaut. And I think we, we do not want to replace robots. Or robots. We we need robots to do things that we cannot do. We need robots to do things that we don't want to do also. They are too boring or too repetitive. And we, you know, when we start doing things that are very repetitive and boring, uh, we start making mistakes. And in fact, we brought up in space a, a robot, it's called an Android, that was built uh, uh, by GM, General Motors and NASA in a joint venture. And this guy, it's only from here up, has very dexterous hands, and, uh, and the reason we brought it up is because they're kind of doing a, a test in, in trying to figure out what kind of stuff. Ooh. Fernando, for you. Fernando, you need to come in space because there are a lot of things that don't work, so. How are we doing? Still keeping up? All right. So I was saying, you need to do the usual things that you do on ground, on Earth, like cutting hair, which is not so obvious in space, because here we just go to a barber and he cuts the hair. There, there is no barber, so you have to trust each other. And believe me, it's not, no more terrifying than to have somebody else cut your hair. And, uh, and on top of that, you know, little things go around, float around. You don't want to breathe your hair. You know, they're kind of nasty when you breathe them. And, uh, and also, they go into equipment, start blocking stuff. So here it goes. There is a little uh, cutting machine with a vacuum cleaner, and you have to suck up all the hair. There is nothing more difficult, by the way, to cut your toenails in space. Because here, you just do this, and you go down. In space, there is no gravity pulling you down. So you're doing this, and you're trying to reach them. And, it's re and then you float around and bend. Some and then you cannot just do it. When you clip the nail, you need to grab it because it goes around and you breathe it again. So you need to, to cut your nails in front of a vacuum cleaner. I mean, it's, it's quite interesting. I would say these little things kind of uh, kick your butt, like try to wash your hair in space. I mean, for me, it's okay. But for her, for Katie, it was quite a, every time it was quite a problem. First of all, you, cannot, you don't have that much shampoo. They just give you a, a little uh, bottle about, uh, I think it's 150 milliliters of special uh, shampoo, which you should put few drops in your hair. It's called dry shampoo because you put few drops, you just uh, rub it around, and then you take a towel and dry up. Well, ah, one of these bottles, they give it to you and they tell you it's for, for a month and a half, by the way. So she would use half of the bottle every time, then would use some more water, and also water is not so simple. And then you see, you see drops of water floating around all over the place. So you need to be careful because then water goes around and, and you know, if ground sees you, then they get upset. So it's not so simple. By the way, she's inside the toilet. And if you look carefully, this thing here is where we usually, where we usually pee. So you, if you need to pee, you need to turn on the toilet, which means a lot of people know that you are on the toilet. It looks like, a, you know, a, a jet aircraft uh, starting. And then you take off, you, you remove this... Uh, this uh, cover, and then you pee inside, and you try to to make it so it goes in there. So uh, we do we do recycle all the all the water or all the urine in this case because uh, because water is a very precious uh, resource, and you cannot just bring it up and just throw it away. So we recycle it as we recycle sweat. Sweat it's a lot of people don't think, but we sweat a lot of. Uh, uh, a lot of water or humidity 
that gets into the atmosphere. Here you just open the, the window and it goes out. But, but imagine if you would take a, a, a shower in your bathroom with the door closed and you know, everything gets damp and you keep taking a shower and you keep the, the, uh, the humidity in there. After a while, the humidity starts condensing. It's a lot of problems. So what we do there, we just uh, have the, water, the air circulating very fast, goes into the environmental control and, li and, control and life support system, ECLES. <laughs> and, uh, and this system uh, uh, cools the air, takes the water or the sweat out, uh, is thrown into the recycle uh, system, uh, takes away the uh, carbon dioxide, uh, cleans it, and then puts it back in the atmosphere so you can breathe it again. So in, uh, contrary to what people think, the air in the space station is very fresh because it's continually circulated and continually cleaned. No comment about reusing the water all the time? No, eh? I always get the water like, how can you drink each other pee? Well, it's not pee, it's clean first. And second, I always tell people that, wh what do you think? When you open the tap at your house, you get just fresh water coming from space or something? I, I bet that was drank by some dinosaur or a Roman gladiator some, some, some hundred years ago and gets back in circle, I mean. The difference is that we know, we know the water because it's, uh, the, the quality of the water, but it, because it's controlled very, very often, while the one that you drink from your tap, I'm not quite sure sometimes what there is inside there. So, going to the next one, uh, there is another thing that we really like to do. We really like to go on this guy here, which is called the cupola. Uh, uh, by the way, a lot of these modules like this one were built in Italy. Uh, Italy has some kind of uh, industrial capability of building these big modules, so even NASA and the European Space Agency uh, gives contract to Italy to build these modules. This was built, built in Italy too. And, and th there are seven windows, so you can actually see the Earth. You go there, put your head down, and you see the Earth under passing by, which is really, really nice. It's one of the best places where we like to go, uh, look down at Earth, I really like to go there, take pictures, and then uh, send it down, uh, tweet the pictures down. You can still uh, see these pictures, by the way. If you go to Flickr, uh, you, you call for Magistra, which is the name of the mission, or Paolo Nespoli, or Astro Paolo, whatever. You see the stream of these 500 pictures there with a lot of comments, very interesting. Uh, this is the cupola from inside when we are not, we, and we use it from a technical reason. Uh, we use the, there is a, a robotic uh, control station in there and we move the robotic arm that is outside the station. We actually use it to move around modules and do some other things. Uh, here I am, here we are actually moving a big uh, Japanese uh, cargo ship that just arrived on the station and we are moving it around. Pretty interesting, by the way, because you really don't want to go there and smack into this guy, and then this guy starts of tumbling around the sky. Then somebody needs to tell the Japanese, oops, sorry, we lost your spacecraft. Here is the spacecraft. It's about 10, 10 meters uh, long, 5 meters wide, uh, pays few tons. There is a, this part here is, gets uh, connected to the station, and then you can get in. And this part is a pallet that we go grab, where is it? Oh, here. We grab this part, pull out the pallet, and there is on it a lot of experiments and equipment that are then put around the station. So this is a very interesting uh, uh, supply spacecraft. Here we are at the cupola uh, having fun a little bit. Is uh, uh, Dmitry Kondratiev from Russia and myself uh, uh, using some cameras to look out and see a few things. We saw a lot of things. I mean, we took as a as a expedition, 26-27, we took 60,000 pictures, uh, excluding the Russian one. We, we, I think they took another 30,000. And uh, I personally took 24,000 pictures. These are, these are some of the pictures there. So these are uh, glacier. And uh, if I'm not wrong, these pictures here is from uh, Patagonia and South uh, America. This one, what is this one? What can it be? Spain. No? Huh? Polynesia. Close. It's actually 
the Caribbeans. So Barbados and the center of the Caribbeans. But it's very nice. I mean, this, uh, this uh, big Polynesia is very little. This, uh, this uh, it's a big area. It's blue. It's really, really blue. What about this one? So, so during at night, you actually, during the day, you really have uh, a lot of difficulties to see cities. Some of the cities you can see, but not that many. But at night, you see all dark, and then you see the cities. So who knows, uh, who can, who knows what this is? What? Huh? Florida. Yes, this is uh, Florida in English, Florida in uh, English, and uh, no, this is good, it's good. What city is this? Miami. What, are you American or something? Florida, no, cannot be. Miami, okay, what is this one? Cape Canaveral. What about this one? Tampa. Holy cow. What about this one? <laughs> All right, I don't know either. Uh, yeah, but this is Florida, or Florida. What about this one? D Dubai? Well, it's not quite Dubai, but it's close. It's actually Bahrain. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, this, uh, these guys have a hunch on building artificial uh, islands and then building buildings and houses and things like this, and it's really interesting. It's really, I like the the fish idea here in the sea. Uh, but but at the other side, you, you can see that we start making a, a difference on, on our earth. You know, we start changing things. And, and if you think that these pictures, you know, you're talking about 50 kilometers, you start to see that the, the impact that we have on our planet is not, uh, is not so simple. I mean, we start you know, modifying things uh, on a large scale, not anymore at kilometer size or 100 meter size. What about this? I should say one thing, that uh, it's interesting when you look at the, at the night pictures, you can actually, well, first of all, you look at the pictures, nice and whatever, but if you start looking at it a little bit more than just from an aesthetical point of view, you can start deriving a lot of from the pictures in terms of uh, cultural issues, economical power, industrializations, how many people there are there in that special place. You know, there are a lot of things that you can derive. So, so if you fly over Africa, for example, you don't get you don't get that many cities like that, because first of all, the population is pretty rare, and second, the industrial capability and the economical power is simply not there to have a big infrastructure. So what is this one? It's not Madrid. This is actually difficult, so I'm going to tell you. This is Beijing up there. This is the airport of Beijing. This is Beijing. And this shows you the level of industrialization of China, which is getting up pretty fast as an industrialized nation. And it looks like they like their light too, because it's pretty lit up there. And, and by the way, I see the original picture is much more here. Because of the light, you don't, see, you don't see much. But it's much more than what you see there. What about this one? This is a monstrous city. So now we are talking like 60 kilometers, 80 kilometers, 100 kilometers here. I mean, this is one of the biggest cities in the world. This one is not real. This one you can actually see during the day, clearly see it. I mean, contrary to, to any other thing. This is Tokyo in Japan, by the way. And the reason why this is dark is because these are mountains. If it would be flat, it would be like that too. So it's, it's kind of uh, interesting things. But this is, uh, this is um, Tokyo. This one, it's also extremely interesting because this is very difficult. I, Okay, who? He knew about the eight minutes. So what's what? What is this one? Now this is very difficult, but it's very interesting at the same time. So let's look at it together. It's by the way, north is here, so it's a little bit skewed. But this one is uh, Seoul in uh, South Korea. This line here that you barely see 
it's clearly visible on the original one, but this one that you barely see is the, the demilitarized zone, the one where there's fences and they're looking at each other, ready to shoot at each other. And then this one, it's North Korea with the capital of North Korea, Pyongyang. I think there are three people with a couple of, uh, of uh, candles in there. And then you see the border of China again and picks up again with the cities and, uh, and light again. So here you start making all these uh, political, economical considerations. I mean, and, and I'm telling you, just looking at, look at this. this. These dots here are actually fishing vessels. With, uh, you know, they fish with these big lamps on the, on, the earth, on, the, on, the earth, on the sea to attract fish. So they are all right there, just below. There, there's a lot of things to fish here, but nobody's there fishing because they simply cannot. So it's really interesting all these uh, social, economical, political things that I was telling you earlier. Ah, what about this one? What is this? Oh, come on. Alaska. Alaska. Good guess. Wrong. That's far away from Alaska, this one. It's actually Europe. What can it be in Europe? All right. I better speed up a little bit. This is actually Italy, you, you, you mentioned it. This is Italy, seen from north. So I'm looking from, uh, let's say, UK. UK is right here, and I'm looking down south. So this is Italy right here. This here is Switzerland. This is Germany. Probably, I'm guessing this is Munich, Frankfurt, you know, or Cologne, Frankfurt, this area here. But, but look, Italy. I mean, Milan, Torino, you know, Padua, Venice. Florence, Rome, Naples. Wow, we must love our lights in Italy. Eh? We don't really like the night. Look at how much, how much light is there. And so I'm, I'm telling my fellow Italian citizen, holy cow, you're spending, you're spending a lot of uh, money uh, you know, lighting up the sky because if I see it from the sky, it means that the lights are, are pointing up. They should really point down. So, so uh, more... Uh, political and economical uh, social considerations there. Well, this is a picture of Rome, by the way, seen from up there. I just put it in. It was a nice one. I, I have some from Madrid and Spain, but I did not have time to put them in. So, ah, This one is a nice one, too. This is now, again, Italy seen from... What? Sicily, yes. This is, again, uh, Italy seen from south. By the way, I got beaten up on Twitter and Flickr because I was taking too many pictures of Italy. I'm sorry. I mean, <laughs> I don't know why I really recognize Italy very easy. But at the same time, I would say that Italy is one of the most recognizable country, countries in the world. Uh, there's the Mediterranean around. It's well-defined. Alps up there. There's a volcano here, mountains. I mean, it's really, it's a really, it stands really out. And, uh, and this picture is remarkable because you can see the atmosphere and this uh, greenish uh, glow is, is actually an aurora borealis going on up there north. So you can see how thin is the atmosphere. Very little, it's very thin. That is the, the thing that differentiates us from Mars. If we would don't take care of making sure that this thing stays there, we are going to be in trouble pretty quickly. We said we go in space, and uh, we go in space for doing a lot of things. One of the things that we do, we do work on material science. I'm an engineer, so I like to talk a little bit about this one. This is a candle lit up in uh, here. If I would take a candle, I would lit it, lit it up on Earth. This is what it looks like. Do you, can you imagine or can you think what happens if uh, you try to lit up a candle in space? Anybody can? Very small ball. Sphere, fireball, fireball floating around, wow. We need oxygen, well, yes, you, you do it inside the spacecraft, not outside, yes, yes, no. Autocombustione, so the whole spacecraft will catch fire and that's it, wow. Well, actually, actually there it is. So there is no more gravity, you get a sphere, you get a, a sphere, a small, I don't know, you get a sphere around, but look how blue it is. That means that the temperature of this is very low. 
because the temperature is proportional, the color is proportional to the temperature, which is proportional to the amount of oxygen that is burned. And here on Earth, you get this convection. It means this is hot, goes up, takes, uh, takes oxygen that is here, drags it up, takes it up, and, and so the, the flame self-sustains itself. In space, there is no more uh, heat, there is no more up and down, there is no more going up and going in. You lit up the, the candles, it burns the little oxygen that is around, and then it goes off. In fact, do you see how, how, how bad it is? Because they lit it up many times, because it just, just stays lit for a few seconds, and then it dies by itself. So just, this is just to tell you that the environment in space is really, really different than here. And you can really do and see things that you cannot do on ground. These are little crystals that are grown in space. You can grow crystal on, on ground too, but after a while they start breaking down because the gravity has a pull on them. So they break, they don't grow bigger than a certain size and they have a lot of defects. But if you do this in space, you get really big crystals which are really nice and, and you can study things. You can do sensor, for example. Some sensors are built in big crystal grown in space. So it's, you can do a lot of things from material science. This is a picture that was taken on the space station where I, when I was doing a life science experiment. This is a, a little uh, incubator that contains about 1,000 one millimeter long little worms that we brought in space. And the scientists were looking at it checking out what do they do in space, how do they behave, do they stay together, do they move around, what do they do? And second, these guys have a quick uh, lifespans. It means that you have generation of worms that were grown in space where there's a lot of radiation, so you have mutations in there. So what is radiation doing to our body, to our genes, to their genes, how this influence? So things like that. Uh, we do have... Uh, facilities for uh, carrying out life science experiments. This is Katie Coleman, my colleague, putting some uh, samples inside this refrigerator. We have this, uh, this uh, facility here. It's a minus 80 degrees uh, uh, refrigerator because when you take urine or blood samples, you need to freeze it so fast and so uh, low so you can maintain uh, some of the hormones or some of the qualities in there that can be analyzed later. If you don't put it, you don't freeze them so, so low, then you lose all of these uh, things. Um, we did uh, get a visit during these six months in space. We did get a visit of two space shuttles, not even one, two. And it was really interesting. Uh, we did also a lot of things like uh, we did, we are in this, this thing I'm checking my eye because they found out that in space the pressure inside the head increases because all the liquids come up and it starts squeezing the brain and squeezes the optical nerve. And so they did not realize this until they had a couple of three astronauts coming back and not be able to see anymore the same way they were. And it turns out that because of this constant squeeze for six months, they got permanent damage on their optical nerve. So we, we, do, we do constantly now continuous examination, making sure that your optical nerve uh, is, is okay and figuring out what's going on. But all of these have implication on Earth. These are used then on Earth. For example, uh, uh, this is another one. They, they put you a, a, a brain, uh, well, a system that records the brain uh, waves and checks how the brain adapts to this uh, zero-G environment. Because as I said, things, you need to do things in a different way. This is similar of people that have accidents and suddenly they lose the use of an arm. They really need to re rework their brain, rewire their brain, so that they need to learn to do without an arm. And in space, it's the same. You cannot walk anymore. You, you have to walk using your hands. And, and, and so you, you do a lot of this work, so they check the way that our brain does it in order to derive ways that uh, can help people on the ground. This is a, this is a few things on research and technology. This is a, a Russian... Uh, EVA, extravehicular suit, uh, it's actually a mini spacecraft that, put, that you put on, you wear a spacecraft, and then you go out and walk in space. If I, if I find who called this walk, where you cannot walk, I mean, I, I, I don't know why they call it walk, you cannot walk, 
And on top of that, it's, it's a very exhaustive. It's like a marathon. So it's, uh, it's very, because you are six hours, seven, eight hours inside that thing, it's really exhausting. This is another one, uh, another experiment. It looks simple because there are these uh, containers which have uh, different shapes, and you can change the shape of the container uh, using some, uh, some um, instruments up here. And it's interesting how uh, the, the liquid on Earth, you, you pour it into a glass and stays on the bottle. In space, you cannot pour it into a glass. It won't stay there. Uh, so, so they find out that if you change the shape of the glass or the container, there are some shapes that actually work like a pump. They, they, the liquid will just go in one direction. And this is interesting because now you're building a pump without any working part, without energy, without nothing. The water just go there. And it's really interesting because in space, suppose you have a, a um, tank of uh, a f propeller for, for, for a rocket, and the propeller is all over the tank and you need to fire the, the engine, you have to go and look for it. But if you have a tank that throws the propellers in one direction, then you already done half of the job that now we need to do with the complicated and, and uh, equipment that breaks. And so this is also a lot of experiments. I know that for us it looks very weird and I know Scott one day was moving barely moving one of these things and suddenly and see the, the, the experimenters look at it they, so it puts this down there and then turns on the camera and the experiments are down experimenters the researchers are looking at it like this and, and it was moving and suddenly we hear stop 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 don't do anything and apparently they saw something that they never saw before and we kind of like okay and we saw the thing moving so slow and they were kind of yelling and singing and dancing on the ground so things like that happen in space uh, this is a this by the way is a 3d video camera that we brought in space or the european space agency brought in space this one it's a uh, radiation sensors the senses radiation in three space because uh, because in space one thing that happen once in a while you have one of these heavy um, uh, particles that hit your eye, for example. So you're sitting there, poof, it's like a flash that goes out because it hits the retina. And they're trying to study, understand where this, they are coming from, what they are, and things like this. Uh, we, do, we do need to keep in shape a little bit because uh, we lose uh, bone density. So in space, you go up, you are, you are okay, and then suddenly you become you exhibit the same, uh, the same things that usually women at 70 years old uh, exhibit, which is osteoporosis. So we go in space and we start losing the, the calcium on the bones really, really fast, almost uh, 10 times as fast as the people on ground. So in order to kind of slow down this process, we actually do two hours of physical fitness per day. We use this uh, thread mill or a, a cycle, a cyclet, or kind of a space bicycle, and um, we do also do a exercise with a with a resistive machine, a kind of a weights in space, which is interesting. I'm going to skip this one. This is another one of the windows that there are in the Russian segment allows us to take vertical pictures with the long uh, lenses. Uh, a lot of those detailed pictures I took with this uh, 800 millimeters that is equivalent of 1,200 millimeters, so pretty, pretty interesting. Here it's uh, Katie and I waiting for the space shuttle. Uh, the space shuttle comes up to the space station, then flips around so we can take pictures of all the tiles uh, so that we can analyze and see if there is any problems. This is uh, uh, us up there, six from the space station, and then seven more from the space shuttle. So for, uh, for 15 days, we were like 13 people in space. A lot of, uh, a lot of activities going on, spacewalks. So I took two of these guys, put, put them in their spacesuit, and then send, send them out uh, to work. Here they are outside uh, working. Uh, we did also some of the um, interesting things. So this was uh, taken on 12th of April, 2011. That was the 50th anniversary of the launch of Yuri Gagarin. So, so here we have uh, Yuri Gagarin. The pictures of Yuri Gagarin is always there on the Russian segment. And we ate uh, better food than usual. 
which is the cans, 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 and a little bit of salami. Oh, look at that. And also salami here, too. Uh, there was also another interesting thing. And in, in the second shuttle, uh, a colleague of mine from Italy again came up. It's weird because he took one of my shirts, so it says Paolo Nespoli again. So it's Paolo Nespoli, Paolo Nespoli. But this is actually Roberto Vittorio, another Italian astronaut. And we were in space, two Italian astronauts, which is not normal. But it doesn't happen every day. Uh, so I put up the picture there. Uh, this is uh, just before leaving. We were ready to leave after six months. We put our, our um, emblem up on the station. For the occasion, I, I was wearing a jersey from the Inter in Italy. That means that 20% uh, of Italians love me, 80% hate me. So We also uh, tried to fly in space a flag of Italy. Uh, this was interesting and, and nice. As, as you know, the, this year is the 158th anniversary of uh, the Republic of Italy. And this was part of the celebration that went on all over Italy. And then it was time uh, to leave. This is the moment in which we go back to our little spacecraft, close the hatch, and uh, go back. There is not that much space in there. I mean, it's really, really small. In fact, uh, in space I grew six centimeters because the, because the spine kind of elongates and and it was even difficult to actually go back again. You know, I think my head would not fit in there anymore. Interesting. We did uh, have the opportunity to take some special pictures. This was, these were the only pictures that were ever taken with the space station and the shuttle dock. There are no other pictures uh, done. If you see any other picture, it's not one of these. It was done on the computer. But we did it. We did it. We, we actually detached from the station, stopped at 200 meters, and then did a, a weird maneuver to go up, and, and I was up there taking these pictures. And, uh, and then we, they were published. So these are the only pictures of the whole space station with the shuttle. Pretty interesting. And then eventually, you know, a couple of hours later, we were coming back on this uh, little thing attached to a parachute, and it slams down on the, on the Kazakh uh, uh, steep of, uh, or, or uh, ground pretty hard. And, uh, and eventually, eventually, about an hour later, they take out. This is Katie Coleman talking on the satellite phone, saying hello to people. She looked pretty relaxed and happy, and she was moving or something. Uh, I was barely able to raise my hand and finger. Uh, well, that was it. There was the four people carrying me around. It's very, at least for me, it's very subjective. But for me, coming back to Earth and getting bad gravity is really, really bad. I mean, I, I usually say, I want to see them. I want to see you translate this. Gravity sucks. <laughs> yes, this is what I tell people. Gravity sucks. I mean, it's pretty bad. So, I'm going to conclude and leave a couple of uh, few minutes for some questions if there are any. Um, this was what we did now. But in fact, what we want to do is actually to, to con uh, continue explore. This is what I really think we, want, we would like to do. Continue exploration, maybe going back to the moon, going to Mars. Uh, I don't know. Uh, this picture here is actually taken from one of the robots on Mars. And this little dot is the Earth. So you are here, they are telling us. You are here. And, and the reason why I, I show this picture is because I usually uh, tell uh, young people, and I consider all of you young, Respect to me, you are young. You're young for sure. What happened here? Um, and, and I tell you that, you know, I had a dream when I was a kid to be an astronaut and it looked impossible. I'm a little guy from a little town in, in God knows where in Italy. Uh, and, uh, but I had this dream and, and eventually, you know, uh, I was able to fulfill this dream. And, and I know that you guys have dreamed too and you really need to to work on it and get them done. Uh, first of all, you need to dare to dream, and second, you need to have uh, uh, the strength uh, to pass by the mistakes that you're going uh, to do, to overcome what people will tell you that things are not possible, and just keep going because, uh, because some of the dreams, even the wild one, can, can actually get true. And I'm looking forward in a 20 years to, to have the situation reversed, I should be sitting there and then 
Some of you should be up here and showing us the pictures from Mars and show us what, uh, what happened up there because I'm really curious. There is water up there and do we have uh, life? Was there a life out there? I'm really curious and I'm looking forward for uh, hearing this answer for, from uh, one of you in the future. Where is my boss? Fernando, do we have time for, for questions? All right. I, I will say it, so. So, so tomorrow night, 9 p.m., the space station will be over there. Yeah. It will actually fly over, and it's relatively easy to see it flying over. Right now, it's a pretty big object. It's a pretty big object, and uh, you, go, you can go online on Internet. It will tell you exactly when it will pass and the magnitude and uh, the, the, the location. It's very nice to see, actually. Thank you for, for this. Um, what I wanted to ask you is that uh, one of the objectives of the space station is to uh, allow the collaboration of many different countries. And we have people from many different countries here. So what do you think is the main uh, lesson learned in the space station that we can take, uh, each of us can take with us home on that aspect? Well, yes, you already, you already mentioned it. I mean, the space station is the, is the result of international cooperation. I said it, that there are... Uh, United States and Russia. You know, in, uh, in 1986, I, I went to the movie because I really wanted to see the sequel of 2001 Space Odyssey. And the other one was 2010 Space Odyssey. It came out in 1986. I really liked 2001, so I wanted to see 2010. I was sitting in the movie and I was looking at the space station. There were all these people around this table in a blue suit, very much like this one. And, and some of them had the American flag, some of them the Russian flag, some really had ESA, like this, written on it. And, and, and this was the space station, as uh, Stanley Kubrick thought of it in 1986, and I simply said, this is impossible. It will never happen. Guess what? In 2010, I'm sitting on the space station, and I'm looking around the table, and this, this is what I see. So, international cooperation, even between two enemies that have fought for years and years and years, it's possible. I mean, the, the space station is one of the biggest, if is the biggest international cooperation program that has been done on Earth. It's uh, the most challenging uh, technological uh, uh, intense uh, experiment. So the answer is when we want, it's possible. And uh, especially for space uh, adventures or endeavors where costs, efforts, technology, it's so intense. If we want to go to Mars, we should actually go together. It's, it's time that we stop thinking in terms of American, Russian, English, French, Italian, Spanish or something, and we start thinking as humans. So we should, as humans, go to, to Mars and not you know, to plant our nation flag but, uh, but to be there and put our human... Do we have an Earth flag? We don't. We should build the Earth flag. Wow, what an idea. Let's get the Earth flag going. That would be, that would be nice. Just a simple question. Will you go again to space? I mean, okay, I mean, uh, the answer is maybe. No, actually, I don't know. Because uh, right now, the flight opportunities are very little for European astronauts. Uh, we don't have the shuttle anymore. It's very complicated. There are few opportunities. Uh, we have few astronauts in Europe, but we still have some uh, young astronauts that never flew. So the answer is I don't really know. I, I learned that in space, you never say, you never know what is happening tomorrow. I've, see, I've seen people come and thinking they're going to fly immediately and wait 10 years, nine. Or people coming and they were told you're never going to fly. And then, in rapid sequence, they've flown, all of them, in the next three years. So, the, 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 the real answer is maybe. But I would like to go. If I would have the opportunity and possibility, you know, when, when, when they told me, okay, you're going to fly in space for six months, I was like, six months? 
Are you out of your mind? Don't you have a shuttle mission, 15 days, I'm done? Nope, six months. Okay. And I have to tell you that six months is pretty good because you get used to learning space. You really, it really becomes your house. And really, you're able to do things that you're not able later. In fact, I got all the way to five months and then realized that I'm leaving in 15 days and I still have so many things to do that, you know, you start rushing, 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 and you're rushing all the time. So I would like to go again. If I would have the opportunities, yes, I would like to go. It's a magic, I conclude saying it's a magic place because of uh, the microgravity environment, because the way you can look down at Earth. And I really wish that everybody could go, and we are going there. I mean, there are now, there are now companies that are building spacecraft to carry tourists in space. It's going to be expensive for the first years, but then it will go down, I guess. And, and I just, it jumped, just, just thinking, think about having a hotel in space, going on vacation in space, go on a honeymoon in space. So finally, we can answer, do we have sex in space or not? Uh, I mean, do all of this. I think this is, this is what we want to do, and we should, we should really go there. You, you, just a personal note, you remind me, you read a lot of Arthur C. Clarke. Like this, otherwise we don't hear. You, re you read, as, as, as a boy, I, I, I suggest, I, I guess, it, I, I guess that you read. Oh, sorry, thank you. <laughs> All right. I well, you, re you, you remind me someone, as you, as you speak, you read a lot of Arthur C. Clarke and Asimov, am I right? Uh, well, I, I read some. I don't think I read uh, a lot, and I don't think I am exceptional in reading uh, science fiction uh, books. I think science fiction are some of the one that, some books that I like, but, but there are other things that I really like too, so maybe. I don't, I don't think, particularly, personally, I don't think it's really true, but I, re I really like, I really like movies, science fiction movies and books, but, you know, I, I usually keep an open eye and read everything. Okay. I think we, we, Fernando, last question? Last question, okay. Okay. No, not for me, because we have another guest that... Uh, there is, there is this uh, theory that we never went to moon. And, uh, okay, that's it. <laughs> Goodbye. Ciao. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the, the theory that we never got to the moon. And the, the images were filmed on Earth. What do you think about that? Well, I mean, as an expert on the field. <laughs> you can go outside. <laughs> <laughs> I really hate this question. I'm sorry. And the reason, no, no, it's okay. It's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm joking a little bit. The reason why I don't like this question is because, uh, and it's not your case, I see your face, it's not your case. But most of the people that ask me this question, they are not really interested on the answer. And because it doesn't matter what I say, they are always going to find the reason why they are right and I'm wrong. So uh, my answer is that I am, I am convinced that the Americans went to the moon in the 1960s. I am personally convinced. I do not have real proofs. I was not up there. I can tell you that there is a space station and you are floating in zero-g. That I can tell you. But w w I was not on the moon. I was not there. I was about, about this high when that happened. So I don't know. But for all I've seen, for all I have experienced, and I've been working at NASA now in uh, Houston, for, and I, I come from Houston now, for 16 years, I can assure you that this happened. Uh, all these little stories about the flag, not the flag, and all these things. I mean, yeah, you can go there and, uh, and look at some of this, but, but I think these people are ignoring one million more other things that go in the other way, and there is always something weird that you cannot prove or you cannot... Some, for example, I really got upset after my first space flight. I saw, I saw a, a um, cover of a magazine that ESA, the European Space Agency, published. And it was talking about my flight. And the cover, there was a picture of the space station that it said was taken uh, from the shuttle when we left. So I, I was looking at this picture and I thought, there's something wrong here. There's something wrong and I don't understand what it is. And I looked at it, I looked at it, I looked at it, and then suddenly I realized that the space station was upside down. And then I said, how is it possible? I mean, that means the picture is not, is not real. And it's in the cover of a ESA, European Space Agency official magazine. So I called our headquarters in Paris. I managed to reach the editor of that magazine. I said, 
okay, can you tell me where these pictures come from? Ah, blah, 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 blah. So to make a long story short, one of the photographers thought that it would be better for the light, for whatever, because of the orientation, because of whatever, if we flip the station. And he just took it and flipped it. And then published it, and nobody paid attention. Now, I'm pretty sure that in 50 years, somebody will pick up that magazine and say, ha ha, look at that. See, that's wrong. This is a proof that we're never on the space station, and they fabricated this. So I'm, I'm, I don't know. I don't have an answer on these flag things and whatever. There are very little things, though. I've, I went and looked myself. There are very little things. There are many, many, many other things that, to me, are much more heavy proof that they were up there. But again, I can only tell you this is my feeling yeah. and what I believe. Each one of us is like a religion. Do we believe in God? This is the same. Do you believe in God on the moon or not? Well, it's, you have is, to make it out. This is science. The, uh, yeah, well, yes. Thank you. So though. do you Thank believe you. they went on the moon or not? Well, I don't know. I you don't, don't know. know. I don't know. Okay. I, I, I have not decided on, a, on one part. Okay, but I, I, I tell you, I, mean, I really firmly believe that, uh, that we went as, since you're already here and then I close, uh, as I can tell you, because I always get this question, we never met any alien form, <laughs> nor there are aliens somewhere in the United States hidden. This is my thanks. You know, nevertheless, what people think. Now, the question is, do I believe there are aliens? And my answer is yes. I really believe that somewhere in the universe there are some other form of, of life. If you, if you look, do you know how many stars there are in the universe? I don't know. Billions. Because the number is, is so long that... But, but somebody in astrophysics told me, well, you should imagine if you take a hand and you put it into the sand when you're at the beach, and you look at the sands or the, or the little uh, grains, there are more stars in the universe of all the grains of sand and all the beaches and the whole world. So I can, I'm thinking, how is it possible that there is not a planet in there that has the same characteristic on Earth? I mean, I, I think somewhere is there, and we need to go and, and get them and say hello. And if I would have seen it, I would have said that. I was the one that saw them. Sorry, I didn't. All right, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you.